Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. So in today's episode, we're very excited to be in Cincinnati, Ohio. We're all here for the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts Conference, where a bunch of Jungians from all over the country and, and from all over the world come together to share and re-vivify um, relationships and friendships. And we are very excited to have a guest here, Leticia Capriocci, who practices in southern Brazil in the town of Curitiba, is joining us. And would you like to say a bit? Of course. I'd like to thank you for inviting me to be here. I'm a great fan of the show. I've been listening to you from the start. And I'd like to say that you do a great service to the Jungian community. I mean, it's uh, fabulous what you do. And the way you do it, uh, I think I, want, I was once... Uh, reflecting upon it. And I, I feel that the way your conversation goes is much, it's very similar to an analysis session. I mean, things just flow and mm -hmm. things come up and then all of a sudden you move together things and then you have something done and it's, it's, <laughs> it's fabulous to see that. And I want to thank you for inviting us to listen to you. And uh, when I listen to you, I feel like I'm in, at, you know, at a bar with you <laughs> at the table <laughs> talking. And uh, it's great to be really be a part of the conversation today. Thank you. And I really hope I don't regret it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, that's a great segue because that is exactly what we're going to talk about today is regret and um, how it may relate to remorse and perhaps grief and we'll see where it takes us, but we've all had regrets. It's a very human emotion and process. So let's see if we can unpack it a little bit together. Not only is it a human emotion, but it's an essential emotion mm -hmm. that for a client or a friend to come to us and admit that they feel regret about something immediately tells us that there is some self-reflective process happening. And people who really don't verbalize regret frankly, probably aren't really thinking about their lives or their impact on the world. Yes, I'm thinking about how, how often we really do hear about people's regrets. of, And I often think of it as um, in relation to the Robert Frost poem about uh, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. Mm. And I, I took the one less traveled by. Mm -hmm. But we could also regret the other road that was mm. not taken. Mm. What would have happened if that person had traveled the road that was more traveled by, mm. more peopled, uh, friendships, and just another whole vista that would have opened up? And uh, so sometimes I think about things like that as choosing the regret that we're going to have. Oh, if I yeah, if great. I literalize the Robert Frost image of mm -hmm. you can choose one road, but you cannot travel both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which makes regret an absolutely normal and essential part of being human. Yes. Well, and I th I think, you know, this touches into for me kind of puer psychology that I really hope we get to talk about in some future episode. But the idea of the puer for me is someone who doesn't want to make a choice. Mm -hmm. So we could see that kind of psychology as kind of pathologic avoidance of regret. Mm. You know, it's sort of Fear like, of regret, yeah, yeah, you don't want to pick a road. Mm -hmm. So you just mm -hmm. never pick a road because you, you don't want to experience that sense that something had to be forsworn. Yes. Something has to be forsworn. Something may even have to be sacrificed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that goes down hard. I have chosen this and not, not that. that. And there's no guarantee necessarily all the time that I, for example, have made the right choice. Mm -hmm. And that the longer you live, the more your basket of regrets grows mm -hmm. because the longer you live, the more choices you have to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so let's imagine a particular situation, which is not uncommon in our practice, that we have 
a client who's in midlife. And midlife might be somewhere between 40 and 55 years old. And Jung noticed that something happens in the general psyche of people in midlife where the unlived life begins to clamor, begins to kind of knock at the door, which brings uh, often to a crisis mode the unlived life, the choice is not taken. So one of the things I'd love to just throw out is what does that look like when we're working with people and they're the paths not taken, the unlived life starts to pound on the door. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how do we know that that's, or suspect that that's kind of happening? I think we call that symptoms. (laughs) (laughs) So people might experience an ennui. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was sinking into it, but because, uh, you know, I've certainly seen this and it can look really, really, uncomfortable in such a profound way, it can just look really grim. You know, Mm. that's the word that comes to mind. Because if if the unlived life never got lived, and now there ain't no way it's going to get lived, like that is not pretty, you Mm -hmm. know, And, and a lot of times, unfortunately, what I see is people just trying very hard to avoid that reality. Right. So there's seeing that, right? Mm -hmm. Seeing that. So the discomfort that clients have um, with their current life is one of the symptoms that the unlived life is knocking at the door. Mm -hmm. That my job somehow isn't good enough. My spouse isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. Where the house I'm in isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. That nothing's nothing's good enough. And then often as we begin to probe underneath that, you know, knocking at the door are these other options that somehow begin to haunt and perhaps if you don't realize um, you you have this knocking on your door if you don't realize you have these regrets no chance for transformation comes and the bitterness comes yes i was gonna Mm -hmm. say i think what you know and then there's there's sort of that uh well maybe you you kind of know but you don't really want to let it in because if you've gotten to a certain point in your Mm -hmm. life it's going to be very difficult to do much with the regret. I mean, for example, I'm thinking of someone maybe who is, uh, you know, later in life and didn't have kids, let's mm-hmm. say, mm-hmm. and is realizing that that's a real regret. You know, there's there's only so much you can do with that, right? Other than you can't fix it. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. And and so and unless you can sort of let that, unless you can sacrifice that kind of consciously and mourn it and transform it in that way, it winds up kind of uh, calcifying into bitterness, I think, and resentment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about what might be the difference between uh, regret and the need to just grieve something. Right. That you know, the person, to use your example, Lisa, who thought she would be married and thought, you know, that she would have children and is in her early or mid 40s and has to grieve the fact that this, she regrets that life took this course. And it is sad. There's a sadness there. And and, and just to just to back it up a little bit, before one can grieve it, one has to be able to track the discomfort in the mm-hmm. field mm-hmm. and connect to the object of the discomfort, which generally mm-hmm. is highly unconscious. Like people generally will come in with a sense of disease or un- unhappiness about their lives. And so we have to help them or we have to garner some kind of clue as to what's the source and perhaps then leading it to the idea of oh it's the children that i that i mm-hmm. did not have because i chose a career mm-hmm. so that kind of sleuthing that has to happen sometimes for months or longer well because the it. feeling is split off right you're kind of dissociated from it you you just want to kind of split it off and put it over there and so you might speak of it but in this in this way where you know the affect that's attached to it isn't immediately Uh, obvious. I'm also thinking, however, that even if a regret can be sort of, we find a hook to hang things on. Mm -hmm. So the the Mm -hmm. regret could be uh, this person, to use the same example, that didn't have children. But somebody else could come in and regret 
that she had had children. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. Regretting so, the path she took. So yeah. we tend mm-hmm. to really concretize the regret around something I did or didn't do, something I thought would happen, because I, I in quotes, you know, thought that I would be fulfilled if I had had children or if I hadn't had children, if I went to graduate school, if I worked on my career, that that would be the thing out there that would forestall my regret versus something that needs to happen inside. Mm -hmm. I I think that let's unpack that a little bit because that's really, really good, Mm -hmm. which has to do with neurotic suffering, Mm -hmm. the idea of neurotic suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm So cycling back to this idea of neurotic suffering or replacement suffering and linking it into what Deb had said about looking for a hook, that a lot of times when we're in pain, naturally, you want, you begin casting a big net and seeing what you can catch. So maybe you'll blame it on something external. Oh, my, I'm not making enough money, or maybe it's this, or maybe it's my you know poor childhood. And we begin casting around to see what we can land on. And many times we'll land on something that prevents us from finding the real regret because the real regret is going to skewer us. It's going to be so painful that we'll defend against it. Yeah. And that's exactly what Jung was talking about when he said that a neurosis is always a replacement for legitimate suffering. I think I got the words not exactly right, Mm -hmm. but that's what he means is because you're avoiding, you are avoiding the grieving. You're avoiding really feeling that. The pain. Yeah. And your own responsibility, right? Yes. Yes. Yes, because if it's hidden, then it's not really mine. That's right. Or that's the feeling. So that responsibility. You know, Young, I just read this great thing that he said, there is, there can be no responsibility without consciousness. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. You can't, you can't be responsible for it until you are conscious okay. of it. So making it about something else, like I don't make enough money or I had a terrible childhood yeah. or whatever, is a way of avoiding even becoming conscious of that thing that needs to be mourned and sacrificed. Can I, can I give you um, an example of mm-hmm. one of my regrets? Yeah. And, and it's not something big. It's not something uh, unlived life. It's mm-hmm. a very concrete situation that when Joseph said that uh, our theme today was regret, I was thinking, what what are my regrets? Mm. And I remember a very specific one. When my brother got married, mm. I went to the party, of course, and parties in Brazil, they go until daylight. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sounds good. Yay! Yay! Let's all go to Brazil. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's fun. It's tiring, but it's fun. <laughs> um, the thing is, it was around like 1.30 in the morning, and my boyfriend at the time, he looked at me and he said, I'm tired. Let's go home. And we didn't live together. And I said, okay. Mm. And I did go home. Mm. Mm. And um, he dropped me off in my house and there I was because the whole family was at the wedding party. Mm. And there I was all dressed up, makeup, hair, dress. Mm. And I went to bed and it was my brother's wedding and I wasn't Mm -hmm. there. Mm. And I could have blamed blamed him and Mm. saying, oh, but he wanted to go and he said he was tired. But actually that, that, that led me to a series of reflections thinking that how could I do that to myself? Yes, you allowed yourself to be this little betrayal because i'm too good mm-hmm. because I, I i didn't want to disappoint him and he was my mm-hmm. boyfriend and uh, um i don't know i'm i'm uh, um, i didn't confront him mm-hmm. and that's something you didn't stand your ground and, right. and, and that's something mm-hmm. uh to, yeah. that that led to many, many other reflections. And that can be such a big source of regret when we feel like we've uh, engaged in a self-betrayal in some deep level. That perhaps oh, is boy. the very biggest regret. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I have a regret that is, it's a little bigger than that, but it's along the same lines is that um, when my kids were very, very small, my son was a newborn, we moved into a new house and I had this deep intuition that there was something wrong with the house and I wanted to get it. It's an older house and I wanted to get it tested for lead. And I kept asking my husband and my husband was very, um, you know, we just moved, we had two little kids. He was very anxious about money. 
I said, well, it's expensive. The letter, and then if we have to do something, that's expensive. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't confront him. And then my son wound up getting lead poisoning. Oh. Mm-hmm. So that is a regret I've had to live with and suffer. Mm-hmm. We're talking about really, really suffering and, yes. and not perhaps blaming on mm-hmm. somebody else or But it becomes, trying to get away from it, yeah. right? But to sit in the question that it brings up about who am I such that this happened? Yes. Yes. And yes. that's how it changes you. That's how it becomes alchemical, Mm -hmm. because the conscious knowledge of what happened Mm -hmm. works on your soul Mm -hmm. so that you're not the same person after you've metabolized that. And, you know, I want to say I looked up the etymology of regret because we Jungians do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it comes from some words meaning to weep or to groan. Oh, my. Mm -hmm. To weep or to what? Groan. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't know the word. And now I understand. Thank you. (laughs) Oh, wow. So there is that sense of real grief grief embedded in that word. Yes. Corrosive. Yes. Grief, right? I'm back on the idea of the uh, self-betrayal of the things where we have given way to someone or something, a cultural norm, uh, somebody else that wants us to do something or wants us not to do something. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, where I went is in those times, we weren't conscious enough You know, you weren't conscious enough to confront your husband or Mm -hmm. you weren't uh, conscious enough to really stand your ground with a boyfriend. You know, and I can think about a regret where I didn't fight for something. I wasn't conscious enough. And yet I wasn't conscious enough to stand my ground. And that that's the part that brings the tears because I can Mm -hmm. go back to that younger person who didn't pursue a path, a career path that was of great interest, and I pursued it later to become a therapist. But I could not have done it then. And I'm sad for that 30-something-year-old who couldn't uh, stand my ground to pursue this career path and change careers. And there were all kinds of practical reasons and so on and so forth. But, you know, how could I have been more conscious than I was? at the time that I wasn't, you know? Um, And so there's a, that's where I can feel the teariness is, you know, that after all, we do the best we can. And it takes us a while and we can shed some tears for the child or the teenager or the young adult or the older adult that we were and learn from it. That's the consciousness coming, coming in. And it's always hard one. So we might say that self-compassion is one of the medicines Mm -hmm. for that agonizing groan that we feel. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the regret also has to happen later in time because in the moment where you said, well, sure, honey, let's leave. At that point, the regret's not there. It just seems like the right course of action. So I'm also interested in the arc of growth where you finally did land at mm-hmm. the future place and could look back and go, you know, slapping ourselves in the forehead and saying, wow, what was I thinking? Well, in my example, it happened right away. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have another regret that I didn't go back to the car and oh, back to the party. Got it. Um, but then I was scared of driving at night and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. But uh, I understand what you mean. Yeah, that there has to be something that has to wake up in us or be added to us. And, and sometimes uh, in Jungian terms, we call that the observing ego, mm-hmm. that there's some amazing capacity that we have in our soul to even just for a moment step outside of who we are or who we were and survey something mm-hmm. from a larger landscape, which then gives us that kind of sometimes the groan or the gasp, Mm -hmm. but sometimes even euphoria Mm -hmm. that we have a choice we didn't realize. I'm thinking there's a difference uh, between, I like the etymology, between groaning and weeping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that the groaning can 
very easily go into sort of self-blame. Oh, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. I was such an idiot. Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I think of that? Mm-hmm. Why didn't I? Uh, versus the weeping, which is I, I couldn't at that time, and I deeply regret it. It's harder to come by uh, the tears and the self-compassion and uh, one's own inadequacy in that moment to have done differently. I, yeah, I think the, the main thing of regret is that uh, it's done. There's mm-hmm. no way yeah, you can go right. back. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't know if in English there's this expression, but in Portuguese there's an expression that says, uh, you cannot cry over spilt milk. Yes. Mm-hmm. Do you have it? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's done. Mm-hmm. And now you have to mourn it and move on. And I'm glad you, you're not the 30-year-old anymore. And, and later in life you could do what at yes. 30 you couldn't. Yes. Yeah, it's true that there is this danger of sort of getting stuck isn't there either. Mm-hmm. I mean, That's definitely getting struck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Getting, getting stuck in, Oh, I'm such an idiot. Right. There's that. Or you could get stuck in blaming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You could possibly get stuck in the sort of tears phase. If it's more of a sort of woe is me, that would be that kind of neurotic mm-hmm. suffering that we were talking about before. So somehow it really is letting it drop all the way down and really feeling it. And, and I love the image of it dropping down, but it, it has to stay in motion. Mm-hmm. I think we were saying a minute ago is that when it gets fixed at various places, mm-hmm. at one level it'll just stay as that corrosive acid, or another place it's bitterness, or another place it's the groan that just um, won't stop in the body. So it, it leads me just to a curiosity. I'll just mm-hmm. throw the question out is so let's just imagine there's a listener who's just trapped in a regret cycle, and maybe they're trapped. You know, there's the memory and, and bitterness, memory, groaning, memory, tears, but it's repetitive. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think the world is full of repetitive regret. Mm-hmm. What's necessary to break the repetitive cycle? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have actually have a thought about that. W- one of the things is that I think that we can get stuck in, in a cycle when we can't tolerate what we've done mm-hmm. when, when, or, or what mm-hmm. the regret is, mm-hmm. when it's just too painful to think about even. And, and a place in our culture where a, a way out of this uh, regret cycle gets mapped is actually an Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh. Mm. Because when you enter recovery from an addiction, regret is something that you mm-hmm. have to deal with big time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, w- one of the things that happens is uh, when you go and when you say, let's let's say you stop drinking, is you start, as you sober up, you start remembering, you know, the, the mm-hmm. people's mm-hmm. weddings that you were supposed to be the best man at that you didn't make it that day because mm-hmm. you were too hungover mm-hmm. or the, mm-hmm. you know, the time that you, you know, knocked the lamp down and uh, wound up hitting your kid by accident or whatever it is, you know, but there's a lot of it and there's, mm-hmm. and there's regret over lost life. Mm -hmm. You know, let's say Mm -hmm. you were, you were drinking when your kids were small and you'll Mm -hmm. never get that back, you know? So there is, there is a lot of facing regret when, when you're in recovery and that that, I'm using alcohol, but there, there's a lot of kind of parallels with other addictions or even just other kind of um, cognitive styles almost. So if we're going to hold this to the the AA model, this fearless moral inventory, or if we were to reshape it, this fearless owning, owning right. of, Taking of stock. what the regret is, and then admitting it to another person. Admitted, mm-hmm. yes, yes, and, sort of confessional. And, you know, there's, there's a step where you make amends. Mm-hmm. And I have worked with some people in my practice who have very big regrets about terrible things that they did. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I will do is I will say, and you need to atone for this somehow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what will you do to atone for it? Mm-hmm. And and it and we've talked about it. What you know? What is the nature of that? And one of the things that comes up is it has to cost you something. Mm-hmm. It has to hurt a little bit. Mm-hmm. This atonement. It can't be casual. It ha- you have to feel it in order you know? to satisfy something in the psyche that's demanding a balancing yes. out. Yeah, you have to sacrifice something. So you know, perhaps it's mm-hmm. I'm going to I'm going to really contribute some amount of my time to a volunteer organization or something Mm -hmm. like that. But it's sort of a contract that's made. Mm -hmm. 
you know, between you and you about what are you going to do? You know, mm -hmm. you need, this is, that your soul is demanding that you atone for this. And that's a very archetypal theme. It shows up in mythology with uh, the Eumenides, these ancient um, underworld goddesses who would hear uh, the blood of an unjust murder and rise up and pursue the one who had done the crime, um, pursue them to the ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the uh, story with Orestes, I believe, that it's the goddess Athena who has to intervene so that the humanities don't just kill the hero. And, and the medicine is to respect their outrage and to pay them homage. Mm -hmm. Yes. And to set up yeah. actually a temple where pilgrims could come and um, bow to their power yeah. and admit their power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the English word is the Furies. Mm -hmm. uh, for people who don't necessarily know what the humanities are, but the, the, those and their passionate beings of oh you know the wailing and the and the groaning, the groaning. that may connect with the etymology of of that there is huge feeling in the furies and they need to be honored in some way honored meaning recognized mm -hmm. meaning mm -hmm. there's a temple and i make yes. sacrifices to that temple right yes. and, and it's there it's in front of me it's uh, it's uh, well recognized. Right? Uh, it's really it's owned. present. It's owned. So, uh, so you bring up the word sacrifice. So I am kind of wondering, and you had mentioned it with atonement, that what are examples of the kinds of sacrifices that somebody might have to make to um, satisfy oh. the furies of regret? Like, what does that look like in a lived life? Well, let's maybe come up with an example. Let's say that um, a, a woman has um, been happily married. She finds herself on a business trip and she winds up sleeping with a business colleague. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, she's she's got this marriage and now, you know, what does she do about that? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that there's... So, so one of the things you might have to do is confess mm -hmm. to tell your partner what happened. And that's a real sacrifice. And even before that, she would have to sacrifice her idealized image of herself as a exactly. wife and a mother. Yes. Yeah. That that's yeah. the first thing mm -hmm. that's on the altor mm -hmm. of yes. sacrifice. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. I am not or, the, or the perfect marriage yes. that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm yes. not interested in anybody else. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's the Dickens thing about every man wants to be the hero of his own life. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the things that has to get admitted is shadow. Mm -hmm. is, oh, mm -hmm. I'm not a wonderful, kind, virtuous, loyal, committed wife. I also have this urge, you know, for other things. We have to own our own shadow, that those things that we don't want to be part of ourselves are, in fact, part it, of ourselves. It, that's a really interesting point, because we could think about regret as that which introduces us to our shadow. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That the two are really related somehow. Yes. Which circles back to the idea of midlife and unlived life. Mm -hmm. You know, all of the paths not taken, which also includes the parts of our psyche which we found unacceptable. Mm -hmm. I mean, our unacceptable life is also generally our unlived life. Mm -hmm. Yep. That then, you know, mm -hmm. furiously <laughs> wants some attention. Right, and I mean it's interesting that the that the uh, the furies came up because there is the sort of underground aspect to mm -hmm. it, right? Yeah. Like this is mm -hmm. this is what we don't want to know about. This is and Athena suppressed them. Mm -hmm. She had to make a decision uh, in the case of Orestes of whether he was uh, guilty of matricide or not, and she decided in favor of. Uh, you know, the male point of view, enter the patriarchy, and suppress this feminine fury's side. Mm -hmm. And it's there. And it's there. We don't want to be, you know, the, all those parts of ourselves, mm -hmm. the weakness or the greed or betraying someone or betraying ourselves, or lacking in courage, or mm -hmm. it goes on and on. The, mm -hmm. list, the, list, the list is very, very long. So there's the regret. So we kind of tumbled into regret um, around what has been committed, what has been acted upon. Mm -hmm. But if we go back to the idea of the regret 
as the unlived life, then there is a way in which we are being plagued by a fantasy. What if I had only gone to medical school, but I never did? Mm -hmm. So what I'm being plagued by is a fantasy of who I would be or how my life would be. And in the the bitterness, in the in the corrosive acid that that fantasy now becomes later in life, the only thing one can do is to sacrifice the fantasy mm-hmm. that at whatever age I am, I will never be an astronaut mm-hmm. or, or a brain surgeon. Mm-hmm. And and actually many lesser things that we that we thought would be there, which goes to the the fundamentals of uh, psychoanalysis, even f- with Freud, is that adapting to reality is a medicine. Oh, that yeah. that as we continue to entertain that, you know, I could have been a contender yeah. or whatever the fantasy yeah. is, that that keeps us away from love and work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, and it keeps us away from legitimate suffering as well, right? That is mm-hmm. that is the sort of we're back to that definition of neurosis. You know that that there's this fantasy that 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 would have been perfect or that would have been better, and it is that is a defense against your real life that's in front of it's you. It's a defense against being ordinary. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. and that we have to come to terms with that. I mm-hmm. mean, even if you do get to be an astronaut or a brain surgeon. And in terms of lived life on a daily basis uh, with people to love and um, wood to chop and water to carry, there is an ordinariness. And and some of it is, you know, these beliefs of I could have been a contender is inflation or yes. an ideal mm-hmm. idealized image of, of who I could be. Mm-hmm. Uh, versus my task is to do the work that I can do and to love the people that I can love and mm-hmm. just to be a very real human being. And, and we're, we are talking about these sort of grandiose fantasies, mm-hmm. like being a, an astronaut or something. But, <laughs> but Deb, your own story, mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes there are regrets that we can go back and uh, sort of um, make a deal with. You know, like you didn't become a therapist when you were in your 30s, but you did it later. And and that might be the thing that the psyche wants from us is to actually, you know, maybe not go to medical school when we're 60. But maybe there's maybe there's some other version of that that needs to be lived out somehow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But but that's because you you held that regret in your hands and you did something with it. Yeah, I uh it, it, there is a poignance. I'm just uh, really feeling it again. And for the two of you with your regrets, if there's a real poignance to it, that um, I really do regret that uh, and learned from it and was able to make sort of a real world repair by you know, yes. coming to this later. And sometimes the regret is that it, it is done. It's the spilled milk. And um, to suffer that, and there is no way of fixing it or atoning for it. So the regret can can lead us down many different paths. Mm-hmm. But um, as we kind of wrap the conversation up a little bit, I want to come back to something that you were you were leaning into, Deb, that was so beautiful, which was about having a relationship to the ordinary. Mm-hmm. And and it reminds me of the idea of sanctifying the ordinary. Oh. Mm-hmm. And and as Jungians, that's a, that's something that we are very interested in. That what appears to be an ordinary life, when it is ensouled, becomes a life that's worth living. I mm-hmm. um, have have used the example of the children's story, the Velveteen Rabbit, uh, who is a stuffed animal rabbit, and he's kind of cheaply made, but he's very beautiful. But uh, as he gets loved by this little boy and thrown around, he gets dirty and uh, his whiskers get torn off and there's a rip someplace else and whatever else. And eventually he's cast aside and has to be destroyed. And in his loneliness that night, because he's going to be burned the next day, poor little thing, um, a tear rolls down his cheek. And that's the transformational moment. And the the nursery fairy, as the story has it, comes in and changes him into a real rabbit. 
But that's what he gets changed into. He doesn't get changed into a unicorn. He gets changed mm-hmm. into an ordinary brown, uh, run-of-the-mill rabbit, an ordinary rabbit who can then uh, have other rabbits as playmates and do all the things that rabbits do, and that that's it. It's the ensoulment mm-hmm. of the ordinary. Mm-hmm. And to ensoul something is to be able to have the life that we have which is ordinary, and to be able to attend to the way that our imagination and our emotions and the full range of sentiments and feelings actually infuse even the seemingly smallest things that are happening if we're attending inwardly. So I wonder mm-hmm. if that might be, um, you know, sort of a hidden kernel of something uh, lovely in regret, is that we can ensoul it, and and um, by s- sacrificing uh, some of the self blame or rationalization or a hundred other things, or, or the expectation that it will be perfect. Yes, or th- exactly that we what we're missing in all that is the acceptance of ourselves as ordinary, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that our task in life is to do the work that we do as well as we can, to love the people in our lives as well as we can. Mm-hmm. And that that here we Good are, enough. this is the life we have, and it's a gift. Mm-hmm. So use what's left of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and that brings up this beautiful idea of amor fati, which is loving your fate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So whatever whatever the vicissitudes you've been through, whatever regrets you have, whatever dreams didn't get lived mm. out, whatever mistakes you've mm. made, somehow it's all what's it's all part of you and it's brought you here and we can love that. Mm-hmm. Amor fati. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is a great place for us to transition into our dream. Hi, this is Deb from this Jungian Life podcast. Joseph, Lisa, and I have been deeply moved by your response to our work. But producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Once again, please go to this jungianlife.com and click on Be Our Patron. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is a female dreamer, 52 years old, and here's the dream. It is the middle of the night, and I am in the shadowy living area of what appears to be an English mansion house. The room is large and high-ceilinged, but it is dark and shadowy. My attention is focused on a dimly lit table where I am standing and packing to depart. I am packing my final suitcase with books. A companion is bringing the books to me, but who that person is is unclear. Perhaps my young adult son. The books are hard-covered and old, thick and weighty. I don't know the titles, but they are from a prolific 19th century English male author, who I have never felt the need to read, yet I'm taking the care to pack these. I'm sorting the books and packing with haste. While I'm in charge of the packing, I worry about what I'm doing. The books are so thick and heavy and take up so much space. Will I even be able to carry the suitcase? Is it a mistake to pack these? Will I read them? Why take these? Why now at this time? I seem to finish sorting, although I leave everything in the shadowy room. 
I opened the heavy door made of dark wood to peer into the shadowy entryway where my other small suitcases are standing. I peek out into the darkness, keeping my eye out for danger, but also for the unknown person who will come to take us away. And as for dream context, the dreamer says there was a fair bit going on, sadness about difficult relationship with older male friend, healing from injury, and I'm charting next steps and pivot of direction. And uh, in terms of what the main feelings in the dream were, she says, ambivalence about the drive to pack these thick, heavy books. I'm just wanting to sink into that feeling of needing to pack all your stuff up with the idea that you're going to transport it with you to whatever is next. And, and at the end of the dream, you know, she, she kind of leaves it all there, at least at that moment, you know, I leave everything in the shadowy room and I'm waiting for the unknown person who will take us all away. But that moment that we have, which is so psychological of what will we take and what will we leave? And which behind. regret will she? <laughs> <laughs> will I regret <laughs> leaving it behind? I wish I'd taken those 400 books. Will she re- <laughs> is she going to regret taking them or will she, she regret, regret not leaving. taking them? Yeah, it's, it's a choice right. moment. It is. It is. Mm-hmm. And somehow there is this, and she even calls it a drive, a drive mm-hmm. to pack these books. Mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. she doesn't know why. Yes. It's like the dream ego does not understand the importance of these books, but somehow recognizes. And they seem to be important. Mm. I'm just going back to the very beginning of the Mm -hmm. dream. And I I really heard you and resonated, Joseph, of the feeling in it Uh, is so big. But it takes place in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. So we might say in the unconscious, Mm -hmm. and I'm in the shadowy, and we all know about shadow, Mm -hmm. living area of what appears to be an English mansion house. And she mentions a 19th century. So it feels like, is it the past or is it some Mm -hmm. bygone era of uh, in an English mansion house? And what's shadowy and unconscious there and it's not clear where she's going it's clear she's leaving something oh she has to make a decision about it Mm -hmm. an unknown person will take her away so i'm thinking about just writing on that deb is so this is a modern person whose psyche has these enormous library of of 19th century ideas and sentiments Mm -hmm. and feelings and I've been in a big British manor house. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a real, mm-hmm. it's a thing. It has an atmosphere. <laughs> and and what I what, what I find myself imagining is what what might a person be like who is filled with 19th century attitudes? Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting, but I've been reading a book on 19th century authors. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Male 19th century authors, with one exception, which is George Eliot, who is a woman. But Even Thackeray, Carlyle, John Stuart Mill, and I've never read any of them. And um, I'm thinking about something in the past that has to do with highly developed thinking function. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she says they're prolific. It's a prolific English male author who I've never felt the need to read, yet I'm taking the care to pack these. Although I have to tell you, when I hear prolific English 19th century male author who I haven't taken the trouble to read, I think of one person, and that would be Charles Dickens. Oh my Mm. goodness, yes. And and by the way, I finally read my first Dickens novel, other than, you know, A Christmas Carol, like a few years ago, because I was like, okay, I've got to read some Dickens. You know, what was it? It was okay. It was okay. (laughs) (laughs) But you know, these books are tomes. They're, you know, most of them are very thick, you know, and they're usually hardcover and they're all up on the shelf and, you know. It seems punishing to me as you're you're describing it. I, I, I like this part that you read that, uh, and it it caught my attention of, you know, um, 
I, I, I never felt the need to read. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet I, right now I feel the need to pack them and take this very yeah. heavy and big and whatever so, with me. So what's so that I life unlived? Need them. Yes. Mm. Maybe I'll I need, need them. Need them. Yeah. Perhaps right now in my life, I, 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 I need them. And, and I never, never felt the need to before. I mm -hmm. think never that's cared. really good. Especially yeah. when you take in what she said about the context is she's sort of figuring out she's sort of pivoting looking at next steps like maybe somehow there's this intuition that yes. this library will mm -hmm. be helpful in whatever the next incarnation you know, is. you know something that uh called my attention uh, uh when when you got to the very beginning of the the dream um uh, she's in the shadowy area and all, but uh, the word living area called my attention mm. because, uh, well, as a foreign, I know living room and living area is not really familiar to me. And uh, so I thought of this place. Of, well, no, I, I understand it's kind of a living room, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, the word living for me, it, it's a place full of life. Mm. And and that that's the place where these books are. And she's getting help on you know, packing them. And, and, and it's interesting that the suitcases that are outside and are, are already ready, they are small suitcases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like she's putting the books at the end. You and, know? And, and they, they take a bigger uh, room, perhaps, uh, I don't know. All the rest is not important anymore, and 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 these books are. I don't know. It's, it's a shift of values in the psyche, perhaps. Perhaps. And she repeats herself. The books are hard covered mm -hmm. and old, thick, and weighty. And then she says again, a little further along in the dream, the books are so thick and heavy, mm -hmm. and take up so much space. Will I even be able to carry the suitcase? Mm. And I, I wonder if it's, um, you know, somehow a heady thinking function kind of knowledge of stuff that I really should do. Like, you know, uh, we really should um, have learned algebra and we really should have read all these things where, you know, that sense of is this a cultural kind of norm or a cultural value? It doesn't have that feeling for me because it seems mysterious. Mm. It seems like something in the psyche wants these books. And in fact, there's there's this sort of uh, opaque figure of maybe it's her adult son mm -hmm. who's bringing her the books. So maybe there's some kind of masculine part of the psyche. Mm -hmm. you know, we might think mm -hmm. of maybe an honest that's, figure that's who's bringing the books. So mm -hmm. somehow this wants to come forward. And there's an unknown person who will go in, who who, who will take them away mm -hmm. um, in the end of the dream. So it, it looks like a journey, but whoever is leading is this unknown mm -hmm. person. Yes. And 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 outside it's dark as well. Yes. Right. It's yeah. a shadowy entryway, and she peeks out into the darkness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of, if talking about repetition, There's mm -hmm. she mentioned shadowy several times and mm -hmm. dimly lit and darkness, so it's really, there's this umbra throughout the whole mm. thing. I, I think your point is really interesting, Lisa, that it might be something she really needs and something that Psyche, and what she thinks it might be her adult son, something of the masculine that she needs, or it could be something of the masculine that she needs to leave behind if they're old and thick and weighty. Mm -hmm, that's and true. I, it's, I, you know, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm mm -hmm. not it's sure. Not it could be either here. way. Mm -hmm. and, right. And right. that's that's where we would wonder about the kind of the feeling around it. Like, what was the feeling around the adult son? I would, mm -hmm. if I had the dreamer here, I'd want to know that. But I, when I was listening to you, Leticia, uh, I was thinking about there's so much in her psyche that is unread, mm -hmm. that's heavy, and mm -hmm. that she's not sure that she wants to take responsibility for that and continue to travel with it on a conscious yeah. level. Because if she were to leave it behind and move forward, that would suggest it's just going to go into the unconscious. I mean, that English mm -hmm. manor house mm -hmm. somewhere in her psychic landscape mm -hmm will continue living there with <laughs> these unread volumes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I wonder if the decision here is, does she have the libido, the animus, or mm -hmm. whatever other mm -hmm. forms of libido she needs to start reading this heavy, ponderous story of herself? Which also, I think that's that's really interesting. And I, I might elaborate on that a little bit further and say, it might be something kind of ancestral. Mm. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it might be the part of her psyche that's unread might relate to kind of an ancestral family complex. Mm-hmm. So let's just talk mm-hmm. a little bit about that. What is how? What are we imagining when we talk about how ancestral events, feelings, stories? might be leaning upon, you know, a living person. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a little mysterious, isn't it? But, you know, there's, there's emerging research that, for example, trauma can be passed down through the genes. That's kind of above my pay grade to go into that Mm -hmm. uh, in more, in more depth, but certainly we know that there's, there can be intergenerational transmission of trauma Mm -hmm. And, you know, oftentimes when you start looking at family uh, patterns, For example, I I am aware of people who have had a family pattern of children estranging themselves from their parents going back generations, Mm -hmm. that this Mm -hmm. always happens. No one sets out to do it, but it always happens in every generation. And there's this sense of most of familial fate. Yes, and in and in social work, because actually many of us have social work degrees before we became analysts, this guy named Bowen developed this idea of of creating genograms or these maps of several generations going back Mm -hmm. because, you know, maybe four generations back, there was, you know, a great, great, great grandfather who was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Well, the alcohol abuse disappears from the family, but the certain, but the behaviors and belief structures that um, deal with compensating for that continue to tumble down so that in the current generation, there are certain kind of either codependent or dry drunk behaviors or certain um, problems in the belief structure. And the knowledge of where that came from ancestrally falls away. So it just doesn't seem to make sense, but it's there. Right. It would be like leaving the books behind. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't know what was in them, but they might still be. Yeah exerting kind of a gravitational pull on your life. Yeah, the the, uh, genograms that Murray Bowen pioneered uh, really map emotional patterns in families going back generations. And it's drawn out kind of um, like a genealogy chart. It's a little different, but you really can see the ripple effect from several generations in the past Um, on a particular person or persons in a family. And there's a book we can put in the show notes by Monica McGoldrick. And I think it's just called Genograms, and Mm. we will look it up. And she does genograms of some famous families, if I'm remembering Mm. this correctly. I think she does the Kennedys, for example, uh, and some other sort of famous families in public life. And so you can see examples of how this works in a multi-generational way. James Hillman in in the book, The Lament of the Dead, which Mm. is a conversation between him and Sonu Shemdansani about uh, Jung's Red Book. He said that we should, you know, sit on a table and bring back our great grandparents, all of them, and uh, mm-hmm. have a, bring them in. Mm-hmm. And and it's uh, we, they were discussing, because uh, one of the main things, themes that ha- that uh, Jung brings up in the Red Book is uh, the lament of the dead. The yeah. dead come back and they lament and they require things from the living. Which brings us back to regret. Mm. It sure does. It's almost the unlived like, life of the ancestors uh, yes. as a form of current life regret. Yeah. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we do see that even in our clients. I can think of a client who you know took up dance because her mother always wanted to be a ballerina, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or a client that you know became a violinist because dad had his you know violin lessons taken away. Yeah. So there's a way in which thing, all kinds of things, can press upon the next generation. And no, the, Oedipus. The, was one of them. I mean, Oedipus mm, yes. was uh, a family curse, the Lapdasius, uh, and it landed on him. But. Mm-hmm. Yes, we have family curses and family blessings. Mm-hmm. Yes. And the Family Constellation School says that when we uh, kind of come to terms with these regrets of the ancestors, let's mm-hmm. say, that we sort of heal our ancestors, that in, oh. the, in our current life, we can go back and heal the ancestors. Mm-hmm. So, so they can rest, perhaps, or maybe, peace. maybe, and mm-hmm. you know, and and so one of the things we might do with this dreamer, if she were here, mm. is be curious about her ancestors. Mm-hmm. If that, if that would mm-hmm. land the nineteenth century one mm-hmm. mm-hmm. specifically, mm-hmm. I, I would definitely want to know what she knows <laughs> about that. 
I'm looking at the last、um, section of the dream.、Mm-hmm. I seem to s- finish sorting. So that's also an interesting thing.、Yep. What does it mean to kind of psychologically sort something,、right. which is different from reading it?、Yep. Mm-hmm. So it's the beginning of some form of differentiation and discernment,、mm-hmm. which at least is on one level. You know, this belongs in this category, and this belongs in that category, and that's the beginning of taking the masa confusa,、mm-hmm. the big <laughs> cloud of stuff,、mm-hmm. and beginning to have some form of differentiation. Which leads to consciousness, right? If she's in the direction,、yep. although she does leave everything in the shadowy room, right?、Mm-hmm. So it sounds like there's a little differentiation, but it's still fairly unconscious. One of the things I like about the stream is it it is a real expression of ambivalence. Yes, and and I think, and we were talking about this recently, <laughs> about how you know if you're not conscious of your ambivalence, it will trip you up.、Mm. But y- there's a way in which you can become conscious of it and just hold it, just know、hold、that you're you don't have to make choices、mm-hmm. necessarily, right? Always that that ambivalence is normal.、Mm-hmm. And and just being aware of that allows you gives you some freedom to move forward if you've sort of owned it, claimed it, and made some peace with it. Doesn't mean you have to feel you know yay raw about every decision, but just to be aware that there's some ambivalence. It's often I think when the ego and the unconscious are in different places, and to、uh, kind of image each of them and and let the the shadow part or the unconscious part. You know, take a kind of shape and a form, and、uh, do kind of an act of imagination around it, and let it talk, so that you can have a dialogue between those two parts of: should I go or or should I stay? Yeah, I mean, and we might say in this dream, the dream ego is like, ah,、oh, I don't. These books are, you know, they're really heavy, and I've never read them yet. But the adult son, maybe. Mm-hmm. Is is perhaps holding the other stance? Like I think、mm-hmm. it would be good for you to take. These, these. are the ones he's helping to sort,、yes. right? She talks about peering into the darkness and keeping an eye out for danger,、mm-hmm. but also looking for the unknown person who will come to take us away. So this, that the same direction that danger is coming from, salvation can come from. <laughs> yeah, which is such. That's great. Oh wow! It's, it's, it's a real a comment、crossroads. on the unconscious. Yeah. Also, yes, that looking into the stuff inside of ourselves that we're really ambivalent about, or could feel very scary or upsetting, could be the place where we are saved. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is what we were saying with regret.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. So by actually going into it, we might find the way through it and to a new place.、Mm-hmm. Well, I just want to say it has been such a pleasure having Leticia with us today. I'm so, so thank happy you so I can tell you I don't regret accepting the invitation. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it, it, it's been a real pleasure to me. Great conversation. You've been listening to This Jungian Life from our website, thisjungianlife.com. You can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook. Help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show, and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.